Right now, as a church, as a community, both local and universal, we are being called to get into Peter's boat. Literally get into Peter's boat. And this time, the successor of Peter, Francis, our Pope, Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, who is calling us as a church to get on board and to get on board with this idea, this charism, this gift in the church called synodality. We've talked about it. We're going to continue talking about it. Literally, it means walking together, walking together as a church. And it means becoming mindful of the way that we speak to one another and the way we listen to one another. And it's somewhat scary for folks because anytime you go out into deep water, you don't know what you're going to encounter. And just like the apostles in today's gospel, we're a little bit tremulous, we're a little bit nervous about what's going to happen. And we have within this boat all sorts of other people with us. We're not always in agreement, we're not always in the same page, but we're literally in a boat together. And we better get used to working together and praying together and listening to one another. This is the challenge of the moment. And in some places in the United States, synodality has really taken off. We're off to a little bit of a slower start in New York. We're still trying to get things together, and that's all right, but we're working on it. But in the Archdiocese of Newark, and one of our good friends here at the Paris, Sister Donna Siangio, has made all sorts of resources available through the Newark Archdiocese. And they're really moving like gangbusters over there in terms of implementing a synodal structure. And we're going to be looking at that, praying with that, and asking ourselves how we can do it. But what caught me was an article that Donna was mentioned in, but it was written specifically about this theologian. He's Venezuelan, Luciani, or Luciani, depending upon your Spanish or your Italian, how you're going to, how you're going to pronounce it, Rafael Luciani. And he is a layman, and he's been appointed by Pope Francis to help guide this boat. And he says in this article something very interesting. He said about what the bishops are called to do. The bishops are hierarchy. He said, what I listen to binds me in my decisions and in my discernment, he said. If a bishop is listening, he cannot make a decision in isolation. The church is not the hierarchy. The church is the people of God, Luciani said. And being people of God demands that everyone is part of the dialogue. Dialogue. That doesn't remove people from their roles, even if they're in leadership. But each person's dignity must be listened to, she said. This is a space where everyone is to be consulted, everyone. And then he goes on to say, the concept is not new but it seems revolutionary after decades. We're very dependent upon a hierarchical model of church. And what the Second Vatican said to us is we can maintain that, but we have to develop this parallel structure of the people of God, of all of us walking together. And that can make us nervous and fearful because now I've got to listen to other voices. And all of us, yours truly, we tend to listen to our own echo chamber, right? The kind of news we read, the newspapers, our friends very often are of a certain political persuasion or a certain bent in terms of the spectrum. And we tend to just stay in that echo chamber. Synodality is calling us to get into a much larger boat and to come out of our comfort zones and learn patience and gentleness in terms of how we listen and how we respond. Because each one of us are going to want to come to the table with, well, we want to see this and we want to see that, and the church has to and the church has to. The church is you and me right now. What we're in this part of the journey, we have to learn how to listen. And for these theologians, Luciani and others, they're also being very mindful that the bishops need to learn a different way of being church because they can't make decisions 
nor should anyone make decisions, you know, cut off from all points of view. If you come with your mind made up ahead of time, there's no room for God's Spirit to change you or to move you. There's so many cases in the history of bishops who left specifically from the United States but other parts of the world and were determined that nothing could change with the church and they came back from the Second Vatican Council transformed and renewed and they were able to see a new way, a different way of being church. See, for so many of us, what we're fearful of is if we let this go, well, what's that going to be? But we go back to today's gospel. Jesus is constantly asking the church to move out into deeper waters because in the very exercise of doing this, we are discovering a dependence on our part on God's gracious mercy and love for us and for us as a community. In today's readings, we have Isaiah who recognizes after he's been given this glorious vision in the temple that he is not worthy. And all of us feel that when we stand before the immensity of who God is and who God continues to reveal God's self to be to us. And, and, and Paul, who was very much a person of great strength and at times bluster, has this tension in today's letter, right? Where he speaks about himself as somebody who shouldn't have even been called because he persecuted the church, because he didn't get it. But ultimately he says, I am who I am. He accepts himself and all his defects because he recognizes in the immensity of God's mercy toward him that God has given him a charge, a call to proclaim. And who better than him because he had been so contrary to God's vision for the church. And then in the gospel today, Peter stands before Jesus and as a person who is a subsistent fisherman, begins to see, this is no ordinary person I have in the boat, and feels his own weakness and his own dependence. But that allows him, as the story moves on, to be able to, as we're told by the writer, leave everything and follow Jesus. Right now, the church is being asked to leave a place of security, of how we've been parish and archdiocese and universal church and journey together and trust radically in the spirit. And it's, it's a marvelous thing that Francis has done because he has said, we can talk about everything. We haven't heard that for a while, have we? There were certain questions that boom, got shut down. He's not giving away the story. He's recognizing that we have a deposit of faith that we have to safeguard, but within that we have a living tradition that is constantly asking us to redefine it, to re-understand it in the light of the times and to have the courage to be able to do that together. And so often it's not about, you know, that we're afraid of leaving the old, we're scared of what is new. Even in our own country, think about the people who go absolutely nutso when you talk about critical race theory. And they will pull some sort of obscure article from someplace, see, see, this is all Marx. If people were actually able to engage in a dialogue, a sensible dialogue with persons who understood what critical race theory is, then maybe we could bring the rhetoric down and be able to hear one another and be able to learn that history is complex and how we teach it helps to affect how we live in the present moment. As we begin to, as a church, look at the role or the lack of a role of real substance for women in the church. This allows us to be able to listen to the experiences of women. Talking today uh, with Father Tony and how many wonderful women we've heard preach and how can we incorporate that into our liturgical practice as we begin to explore the historical roots of the diaconate and women's historical place in the diaconate, 
How will that and can that change our understanding of our liturgical practice? These are all questions that are moving us as families evolve, as families evolve, how can we develop a comprehensive theology and spirituality for people who don't fall into the traditional model without throwing the traditional model out the door, but making a place at the table even wider and more spacious for folks, same-sex couples? As we begin to struggle with the anthropology and psychology and sociology and all the ologies of our trans brothers and sisters, how do we develop the humility to step back and say, I don't understand this completely, but I want to hear your story. Because at the end of the day, it's the stories that are going to change us and the stories that are going to allow for us to become fluid as a church and develop a pastoral practice where everybody finds a place on the boat and we're together. Not necessarily always in agreement, but at least together, moving as the Lord desires us further out, trusting more radically in God's gracious plan for us. It's an exciting time, but it is not without precedence. We see in the, in the first reading today, Isaiah in the temple sees and imagines a different world and is able, in spite of his own weakness, see that he has been called. And each one of us here and each member of the baptized church, as we struggle with our own defects, our own sinfulness, our own need at times to control, even our bishops are called to the table and listen to one another for a fair and free exchange of ideas, but most importantly, of people's experience. I think we've recognized in this country over the last 20 or 30 years that it has changed in terms of how we approach our LGBTQ community. And why is that? Because as people have felt more comfortable at coming out, at living their truth, they've recognized I have a brother or a sister or a mother or a father or a cousin or a friend who falls into this category. It's no longer theory, it's real life experience. When people begin to step out of some boats that are very narrow and they begin to recognize a world greater than the world that they've been used to and accompanied by in the past, after the initial fear wears off, they recognize this is a more interesting place to be, more varied, more expressive of God's manifold mercy and love. So as we enter into this time of synod, we must be careful we don't have all the answers because not one of us do or one of us will have. But we know this by listening to one another gently, mercifully, humbly, we can discern the promptings of the Spirit as we move farther out into the water. But the choice no longer is to stay stuck on the shore. And for those people who want to go back to a church that had much good, but also had many problems, that time has passed. As for me, and I think many of you, I'm going to let my fear not rule me. And I'm going to get in that boat with Jesus and Peter and Francis and all sorts of folks, and let's see where the Spirit takes us. Amen? Amen.